Welcome everyone to our Trade Policy Research Forum uh, webinar for December. We'll give you a few minutes of introduction to come into the room and then we'll make a start. Yes, come on in, welcome. We are so psyched about having this extra webinar. Extra exciting, extra holiday season started early. Um, so we're just thrilled to have this. Oh, people are falling in like really fast here. And there's some friends here, even some advisors. Barbara's here. Hey. And speaking of cool policymakers, here is Lars too. So many people that we uh that we appreciate here. Welcome everybody. Can I introduce you to our chat box. My name is Hannah Norberg and I am the co-founder here together with Ben Shepard. If this is your first stop here at the TPR Forum, we're thrilled to have you. And for all of the others, you guys are super welcome back. Um, so as we're waiting for everybody to come in before Fabio gets started, why don't we hop into yes? <laughs> hey, Lars! Um, hop into the chat box and let us know where you're coming in from today. I always find that extra exciting to see. I'm in then Sweden, and I know I'm thinking Barbara is probably in DC. Ben, you're in New York, yep. right? All right, and Fabio, where are you coming in from today? I'm in Italy now, so actually, we represent quite well. <laughs> <laughs> like all right US. well welcome sarah and luke and katarzyna and eva and amelia uh come on in okay so i'm just going to give you a short intro to the tpr forum in case you haven't been here before so the trade policy research forum Ben and I started it uh, in October, it was three years ago, so a little over three years. And we started it as an idea to be able to bring people the brown bag seminars that we um, used to be able to do before COVID, uh, or Ben and I used to do when we used to hang out at the universities. Um, but it has quickly grown to something that is much more amazing than that. So in the LinkedIn group, we have up to 3000 people who interact between uh, research and policy and across disciplines and across uh, generations. And so what we love to do is to bring trade policy to researchers and researchers to trade policymakers and everything in between there. Um, and so we run a monthly webinar and all the previous ones are on our website. Um, together with all the presentations and so on. Uh, what am I thinking? What am I missing, Ben? That's uh, usually the intro, right? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great intro to what we're trying to do with the webinar series. It's great to see so many people here. And maybe we can uh, just move into the presentation. So I can, we're, we're famous for doing short introductions, Fabio. So don't take it personally that I'm not going to list your entire uh, very long uh, CV before we hand you the floor. Um, but we're very lucky to have uh, Fabio Santaramo with us today. Uh, he's affiliated as an associate, associate professor at the University of Foggia in Italy and is also a research fellow at uh, the European University Institute, the Robert Schumann uh, Center for Advanced Studies. Um, so he's done a lot of work on uh, trade over the years, in particular uh, uh, agricultural uh, trade. So he's got a lot of uh, published work in that area. And today he's going to be talking about uh, technical measures, environmental protection and trade. Um, it's joint work, if I remember correctly. And I, I see that we have uh, one of his uh, co-authors uh, in the audience. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, let me just remind everyone um, that we're very happy to take your questions and comments as Fabio is presenting. Please put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. And uh, then Hannah and I will pick them up and get them into Q&A at the end of the session. Um, but Fabio, we're really happy to have you here. I think it's a great topic. Um, there's a lot of interest uh, in it. So let me hand the floor over uh, to you now um, to make a start with your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, it's uh, really my pleasure to be here. So 
thanks for keeping short. I mean, I think that uh, slides should talk more than just my CV. Uh, my CV is just uh, useless to read. Actually, it's more important to say again, thanks for having me here with, uh, within this uh, webinar series. And um, I guess that, um, you know, I've been asked to uh, keep this uh, relatively short. Uh, so I would say that uh, some of the tales uh, of the paper are not gonna be um, presented in the slides. And so uh, some slides also will be skipped uh, just to allow people to um, really focus on um, the takeaways of this. So it's uh, fully correct that this joint work is uh, mainly the presentation um, for the paper with um, Emilia La Monica that I see is, is connected to Charlotte. I'm not sure she's, she's here, but anyway, it's, it's a joint work with them and also joint work that I do with colleagues at the European University Institute where I'm now. I see, I hope that you can see the, the slides well, right? Anna is okay. Uh, you can see the slides, right? Yes. Okay. Yep, we so see then I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, and also, that... Fabio, let, let us just let people know that we will be posting these slides so people can just relax and listen and not uh, right. try to catch up with all of it. It will be on the website after, together with the recording. That's great. So actually, yes, please uh, relax. I'm the only one that should not be too relaxed and indeed focus on this. So uh, really, all, all about I want to say it's um, related to trade effects of environmentally related technical measures. And I put that in parentheses like and more, and I will explain a little bit why the, that and more. Uh, so as I said, basically the bulk of this presentation is uh, related to the paper that I've just uh, completed with uh, Emilia La Monaca and Charlotte Emingler. Emilia is uh, uh, with me actually at the University of Foggia and Charlotte uh, with Virginia Tech, but uh, also with CEPI, I mean mainly with CEPI in France. And actually, you know, just doing great work. So super happy to uh, cooperate with them. So a little bit of motivation of uh, what we are going to discuss uh, about today. So clearly, this is a paper that is related to the broad climate agenda. So uh, what we are observing uh, is that really climate agenda is uh, shaping uh, how governments are acting, how businessmen are acting, so entrepreneurs and the st all the stakeholders, again, policymakers are really trying to use all the intervention strategies, uh, business uh, mechanism to actually fight the depletion of the environment. Um, we know that there are many interventions that are actually in place, that have been in place. Uh, we are floated actually by those uh, numbers and type of regulations. But I think that the old story is that there is so much that we really, really not too much of an understanding of how those things actually work. Um, just to give uh, an idea on things that are really, uh, th that have been really studied a lot or discussed a lot are what we call like market-based mechanisms, CBOM. I mean, everyone that is uh, now in the climate uh, in the climate debate knows that there's a lot to discuss about CBOM, included, I mean, including me at some point to say, okay, I wanna study this because you know, it's just really something that uh, uh, people are gonna deal with. That's pretty much a tariff mechanism. A quota-like mechanism is the in ETS. So that's another, another type of mechanism. But there are other things that clear on the climate agenda that are agreements, regulation. And I would say just to list them, it's completely not conclusive, uh, uh, not comprehensive, this list, but agreements, regulation, like standards, PTA, unit technical measures, all of these are really trying to help uh, trade being shaped in a way that is, uh, again, helping the environment. So the whole point is to use trade policy in order to make the environment better. Now, the point is that when it comes to this, uh, you don't really actually act uh, on trade. I mean, those are clearly trade policy, but they have so-called side effects or just uh, to be more technical, like non-trade uh, policy objective. So basically the whole point is that it's not all about like having a, a trade distorted or shaped in some way, but it's really putting within the trade component 
stuff that are not necessarily um, related directly to trade. That has been very much investigated. Besides those uh, references that I'm putting here, I would say that Bernard Lukman uh, with Doug Nelson uh, um, uh, and Petro Madroi Petros Madroidis have just recently concluded a book that is actually discussing those things very much in detail. So what I'm focusing now today is uh, basically the TVT, so TVT on, on trade and uh, on the environment. Why this uh, is something that I, we believe that is relevant. And here, let me just jump to another uh, piece of, of paper that I'm, I'm writing with Bernard uh, and Emilia. Uh, so here, the short story is that you graphically see that those technical measures are really rising in prominence. So within the last decade, like one decade and a half, you see that yellow line that is just saying that this is a new tendency in some sense. So we have had an increase of international standards. We have had an increase of uh, uh, agreements with provisions, with environmental provisions. But what is really new uh, in the debate is that since like 15 years, the number of technical measures on the environment has just been um, very much on the rise. And that creates uh, exactly our um, research question. So how they are actually contributing to shape the um, trade. So again, um, this is all, all ag again about motivation. So um, the one point that I want to say is that, again, these unilateral notifications that are different from standards or agreements and provisions that I've just mentioned, they are very different. So in some sense, the, the difference is that they are unilateral. They are notified and implemented by certain countries that just want to go above, I mean, beyond what is the uh, common feed. So basically our way to go farther in terms of, uh, you know, standards, I mean, in Latu Sensu for, for the environment. So again, it's a step forward and uh, they are actually you know, well discussing within the WTO. So once they are in place, they should be new regulations or new rules to have uh, the trade working well. What I'm trying to say in a very complicated way is that unilateral measures are basically things that go on top of what has been agreed. And once they are in place, they should make no problem for the trade environment. So basically for uh, the, the global trade, but that's not necessarily what's, what's going to happen. Now, another point that I wanna stress, and this is something that we are investigating that I believe that it was very important to point before the technical details of the paper that I'm gonna show, is that he, given that actually we are gonna have those technical regulation, uh, that those technical regulations, those TBT also put uh, some more meat on the grill in the sense, okay, is there a pattern? It's actually a way to find another uh, set of common rules uh, to, again, not deplete the environment. So can actually those TBT, once we understand what they do, uh, contribute to harmonize the set of rules uh, on, uh, on trade so that, again, we reach higher standards for the environment. In this picture, we're just showing that this is a long as a long path. So we are really far from this. Uh, and before, I guess, getting into the harmonization of those TBT, it's good to understand a little bit in a more refined way what is the effects of those TBT. So let me now make a step back and see why this paper, I think, has, uh, has a, a, real, a, a real place in the literature and in the debate. Because actually, when you go back, actually and say, okay, technical measures, so regulation on trade, you would like to ask, okay, but how those technical measures are impacting trade? So what is um, the effects that they are gonna have? And the literature is very controversial to some extent or not conclusive. You can use the word that you, that you like, but the story will not change. So technical measures are, let's say, sometimes barrier, sometimes they are catalysts in terms of trade. So it's kind of difficult to understand exactly what the effect of those technical barriers, TBT, 
is going to be on trade. And when I say technical buyers, I'm always hesitant because the, the word that we are using is very misleading. They are not necessarily barriers. They are actually technical measures. So they are called TDD, but they are actually technical measures that may be even fostering trade. And I would speculate that in principle, they can foster existing trade. So setting the, the common rules. So facilitating a trade that is already existing. But the short story is that the evidence, the empirical evidence is uh, very mixed. So we don't really know uh, actually if, um, um, uh, if, if the effects of those environmental DVD is gonna be like pro-trade or anti-trade. Let me just pause for a second because I have actually an alarm. Uh, I just wanna know if you hear that or if you're fine. If you, you're fine, right, with that? Yeah, we don't hear it. Okay, so that's, that's. I mean, I think it's a fake alarm, but anyway, it's not gonna hurt me. So if you see me like running, then you know why, but so far it's it's, it's all okay. Okay, so- Oh, it's uh, not, is it like a fire alarm? Not, not I think so, alarm? but you know, most of the time they are just, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not necessarily what, what, I mean, and, and my door is actually here. So I, I don't need to escape, uh, that's my point. Well, for the sake of this, this seminar, let me just tell you, if there's smoke coming in, you better let us go and go outside and get safe. But, you know, go, keep going. Yeah, no, <laughs> so, okay, let, yeah. let me put it this way. I know that it's a very relaxed environment. If I have to go, I, you know, you, you know why, but again, my daughter yeah. is literally <laughs> here, so I can escape in like one second. But thanks. All man. right. <laughs> so, um, actually, this is literature and contribution that I was trying to explain. So, all the point is that we are not conclusive in the literature. So, we know that there are several dimensions that I can explain if the effects of those TBT is positive or negative, which actually tell us that it's good to understand for those environmental TBT, what are the dimensions that explain the trade effects. Uh, so what we want to do in this paper is actually to find the regularity in trade effects and to understand where the heterogeneity comes from. So basically, if it is an heterogeneity that comes primarily from countries, from sectors, and possibly uh, apart from understanding heterogeneity, trying to understand what are the mechanisms that are driving those heterogeneity. Now, clearly, this is a paper that we have already finished, but that does not mean that we have finished the research agenda. Indeed, the research agenda has just started, and I think it's going to last for a few years. So there are many things that we have to do, we are already doing, uh, so we are not going to be conclusive. That's, that's a disclaimer that I have to do. Uh, some stylized as fact while I uh, continue going on uh, with this. So basically, as I was saying, like environmental technical measures are on the rise by number and relevance. You can see this graphically, you can see this for the environmental stricto sensu, so for the environmental measures. But again, I don't wanna be uh, overcomplicated uh, in this. I'm just saying that notification at the WTO, so the type of measures that are for the protection of the environment, they are actually increasing in prominence. So this is a basically- Actually, Okay, I'll go. Uh, so- Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Wow, that's very, that's very good. So we actually, actually have to leave in five minutes. They just go. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's life. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, definitely. Um, well, you uh, do you want to leave now? Uh, well, they gave me five minutes. I'll take five minutes. Uh, that's that's not gonna be a problem. Uh, okay. Um, then probably Anna, what what I can do is actually uh, connect from my phone and ask quest and and uh, answer questions. That that is okay because I will be just outside. <laughs> All right. Well, you do you know, whatever they you need to do to keep yourself alarm, safe. So, yeah, they just stopped at the alarm, so I don't know what's going on. But, but let me go. Let, let, let me try to this. You know, this is real life. So Okay, okay. So actually what's, what's happened is that there is also a huge heterogeneity in terms of who is implementing those measures, who is affected by those measures. What actually this slide is really telling us is that most of the things are coming from IAC. This is not really surprising. I mean, those that are really regulating the most are those that are high income, those that are affected are also high income, but it's also, uh, you know, pointing at one specific uh, question that we have in mind. Uh, how this is really shaping, shaping trade? Is this something that is really related to the environment or is this something that is really related to 
you know, some other form of, uh, I don't want to say the word, so I will not say the word, but say some other uh, reason for shaping the, 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 the trade. And I'll stop there because I know that I'm recording. So um, let's see where those um, activities come from. I mean, which sectors are regulated. It's not surprising seeing that those technical measures are regulating the energy intensive sectors. On top of that, agri-food is also very much regulated in terms of uh, value share. So basically uh, put like 100 uh, the trade volumes, like the share of that trade that is regulated by environmental TBT is pretty high for the agri-food sector. And this is again, not surprising given that agricultural sector is not the most emitting sector, but it's just second. And on top of that, the debate is pretty large. So I think that there is like there is much more to say. It's not just for emission, it's probably also for protection. There are political economy factors explaining that. But just to point where these uh, TBT come from. Now, uh, going to the data uh, notification. So those are the things that we use. So we use notification from the WTO. We cover the period to 2010, 2020, uh, 105 implementing countries. So we use uh, refined data up to H6 digit products. So basically very much into the product level. Although most of the, uh, of the TBT are at HS4 digit level. But that's just very technical details, not very relevant. What is very relevant, I think, is that we use notification at the WTO and collect uh, the objectives of each notification. And then we know that each notifying country is actually claiming that the TBT is for, for instance, like protection of the environment, for human health, for animal health, and so on and so forth. Now, what we keep in our, in our data set is something that is only for the protection of the environment. That is what we call like environmental technical measure stricto sensu, basically the one that we are looking at. So those that should be really only for the environment. We call also mix something that is for the environment, but also for something else. The reason why we want to separate those is because we want to really understand if protecting the environment is associated with, for instance, trade distortions that are particularly bad or uh, you know, along certain dimensions. Uh, those are you know, uh, two, two examples, and I don't want to go into details, but just giving you know, an idea that an environment uh, stricto sensu is only for the environment whenever, uh, whereas actually if you put something else on, uh, on the description, then this uh, may become something that is mixed technical nature. So this is the empirical model. Uh, I think I, I should be fine. I mean, the alarm has just finished. Uh, so I hope that I will be fine. The empirical model is something that anyway, I didn't want to discuss. It's a standard structural gravity model. So we have trade flows actually, and we control for some stuff, and we want to estimate the effects of TBT, but that's very standard. So let me uh, put uh, and, and, and start discussing uh, the results that we have. Basically, we also have uh, you know, mixed results. That's not surprising. Mixed results that are along two lines. So along the dimension of uh, the level of trade flows. So basically, you find different results if you're talking about small trade flows or large trade flows. Why we believe that this is a dimension that is worth exploring. Because, of course, you know, the larger the trade flows, uh, the higher the interest that are in the game. Uh, and another dimension is actually the price, uh, uh, price dimension. So if we look at values or volumes, then we find different results, meaning that it's not only a matter of uh, what you trade, but actually how priced is what you trade. Again, meaning that if uh, you have uh, a higher uh, unit price that may be completely different in terms of uh, uh, revenue that gives to uh, to the uh, exporters. But let me go to the to the meat uh, in this uh, probably like five minutes uh, that that I want to use to conclude. We did some sensitivity analysis. Of course, it's not part of the of the talk today, uh, so it's not it's not my role today. Convincing you that it's pretty robust. And in technical terms, so we addressed like um, reverse causality, did a bunch of uh, sensitivity analysis, and clearly the, the paper has a lot of that. So we're convinced that we're really capturing the effects of 
TBT on trade and not vice versa. And then we come to the counter specific heterogeneity and try to disentangle what are the dimensions that can explain this heterogeneity. So for instance, one of the dimensions that we are going to explore is the level of economic development. So if we're just discussing about high income versus uh, low income or countries that are belonging to G20 that are possibly more influential uh, from a political point of view, but also something that is very much related to the environmental characteristics. Like we have on, on a set like big emitters uh, versus those that are not so big emitters, but we also have uh, on a side those that are high environmental quality, so those that claim that to care very much about the environment versus those that uh, seems not to care that much in terms of uh, their declarations. And what will we find? So here are actually the effects on, uh, um, um, on of the environmental TDT. And this is a very, I would say, um, nice representation of all the results that we have. So think about this um, the graph as uh, a synthesis of a bunch of different regressions, whereas basically each vertical line that you have for instance for high income, G20, big emitters, and so on and so forth, is telling you how much those countries that are notifying the TBT are different with respect to the other uh, the other countries, which are on the baseline. The baseline is clearly the first vertical line that is environmental TBT. So how to read that? Basically, environmental TBT are generally against trade or anti-trade, or to put in a more, uh, in a safer way, they're associated with the decrease in trade, with a lower amount of trade. But this is not necessarily true. This is not what we found for IECA, G20 countries, big emitters, although there is a huge variability there, high environmental quality and notifying and countries that are notifying the environmental TBT, which uh, tells us that there may be a dimension that is explaining why countries are notifying, are implementing those measures. Like as I said at the beginning, I don't want to go too far, but it may be the case that under the protection of the environment, there are measures that are really shaping the trade in a favorable way uh, for those countries that uh, can extract rent from, uh, uh, from global trade. Uh, I also skipped this uh, sector-specific heterogeneity. This is uh, just very technical, saying that we played a little bit with uh, the aggregation to see if the results are consistent. But again, that's not part of the game today. We also did some uh, uh, heterogeneity analysis across sectors. And I would say, while we do observe that there is a, a huge heterogeneity across sectors, uh, I believe that is uh, here is really the case where much more should be done. So um, what we do observe here is that the effects are, uh, again, mixed and only for minerals and vegetables are, are, are really positive. So what we want to do next or what we are actually doing now, and uh, let me see if I can use like a couple of minutes to say, to say that. Having said that, basically there are those trade effects that are clearly there. So environmental TBT are clearly having an effect on trade. The point is, that we are asking us is, um, is that balance with environmental outcomes? So is that something that actually is coming with some gain from the environment? This is what we are using here in this approach. Uh, that is uh, an approach to understand if, again, there is any balance of trade effects with respect to the environmental effects. Again, skipping the technicality, let me just uh, go here and say that uh, what we do find with this other approach is that indeed, there is an effect on the environment that is uh, possibly not so large, uh, but that's really, uh, it, it, it's really, uh, you know, not, uh, not uh, very much a, a conclusion that can be set for all the, all the trade partners and all the, uh, all the, uh, the trade pairs. Uh, so what we want to conclude on, so let, let me just uh, make uh, go to the policy conclusion or, or to, let's go, take home, uh, trade effects of uh, uh, environmental TBT. So clearly we say that those uh, policy objectives really matter. So we focus on environmental TBT, but I bet that this is really the case for other type of notification that act uh, on, uh, for, other, uh, for other purposes. So we actually, again, we said this for the protection of the environment, but uh, 
what we found is that the results are very mixed depending on which objective you are putting in place there. There are mixed effects on price and volume. Why I think that this is very relevant for a policy debate because it's not only really important if you are having a regulation, it's import, it is important on which type of products you are regulating, high added value, low added value, high price, low price. So meaning that, that the quality component is something that uh, we have to consider there. Market heterogeneity across countries, uh, what we found to be you know, absolutely provocative is that there is pro-trade effect for wealthier, more industrialized countries, countries that are very uh, influential from the uh, political point of view, which uh, telling us, okay, it's, that's something that we can, um, uh, uh, we can support. I mean, is, we, we, do we really want to have that? I mean, what's the gain for the environment, given that there is, an in, there is a distribution of, of welfare, redistribution of welfare, that is uh, possibly in the opposite effect of uh, uh, what we would like to promote the development. So given that, is there actually something else that is good for the environment? And this is the last point that I want to say, like trade-offs with environmental outcomes. We didn't find much, but this is very much ongoing in terms of a research agenda. Um, and about the policy coincidence and harmonization of trade policies, I think that what we observe in this, uh, in this paper is that there is no conclusion in terms of uh, how, those, uh, how those policies are actually affecting trade, meaning that possibly is really desirable to go toward the, the direction that I mentioned at the very beginning. So we're establishing really how TDT should be set in order to achieve higher environmental standards and not just another technical measures that, I mean, who knows what it does on trade. And given that, I'm going to stop here and apologize for all the noise that, uh, you know, I've done to it. Look, that was really funny to me. <laughs> well, Fabio, uh, that was the first time somebody has given their presentation while possibly risking their lives. And so we are now, we are just a double uh, grateful for this. This is a brilliant presentation of a brilliant paper. Um, and without further ado, uh, we actually have an outstanding discussion for you here today. So I'm going to give the floor to Ben. And uh, for everybody who's listening here, um, please start posting your questions as we go. We always run out of time. So we'll start doing it now instead of just feeling bad about it later that we didn't get to your questions. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, thanks, Hannah. And uh, thanks, Fabio, for a great presentation. Um, I think this is a really nice uh, paper. And uh, for people who've tuned into these uh, webinars before, you'll know that I don't often uh, act as discussant, but I picked this paper as one that I wanted to discuss um, because I've been working on TPTs and SPS measures, technical measures, uh, all these sorts of things uh, for an embarrassingly long time. And I think it's an area that is still under-researched relative to its importance in the policy domain. So I think a huge contribution of this paper is to take us forward in our understanding of how uh, one set of TBTs uh, really works. So let me talk first about why this paper matters. I mean, what, why it matters to me and why I think it should matter uh, to everyone listening. Um, as Fabio said, environmental sustainability has been intersecting with the trade agenda for a long time. I mean, this is nothing uh, new. It, we were talking about this in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, we're still talking about it now. However, there's a whole new spice that's been added to the conversation because of climate change and the ways in which countries are responding to it. So it's a particularly salient issue uh, right now. Measures like CBAMs are directly using trade policy to pursue environmental uh, objectives. And so that automatically leads to the question of how we treat regulatory measures like TBTs that are really about something else. They're about a non-trade objective, but they can have trade effects. So how do we understand those? Where do they fit into the trade policy uh, landscape? I think identifying the trade effects of these measures is really important because uh, exactly as Fabio said in his last slide, it can help us figure out the costs and benefits of uh, different measures. And, you know, ideally, what I think we'd all like to be able to do is to rank policy interventions. If you think of, uh, you know, the late Max Corden, he, he just passed away uh, earlier this year, and his theory of domestic divergences, the idea that you have a first best policy 
for dealing with the domestic policy problem. Tariffs and things like that are usually a second best policy. But where do measures like TBTs fit that have trade effects, um, but are nonetheless uh, domestic uh, regulatory measures? So to get this idea of the trade effects can help us rank policies in a welfare sense, which I think is ultimately uh, where we want to go with the work. So what does the paper do? Um, as I said, it's an under-researched area. Um, in the presentation, Fabio did a great job of telling you about everything uh, that's out there. But one bit of colour that I would add to that is that when you go and talk to exporters, particularly in low and middle income countries, and you ask them about the barriers that they face when they try to enter the European Union, United States, Canada, Japan, um, they'll normally say that tariffs are not the problem. Um, there are two reasons for that. One is that tariffs are re relatively easy to figure out because they're clear, they're just a tax, you, you, you can uh, do the math very easily. And then the second thing is that they're generally pretty low um, in the uh, high income markets. There are exceptions to that in particular uh, market segments, but generally speaking, they're quite low. So when you go and talk to exporters, always what they want to talk to you about is technical measures, regulatory measures that they have to conform with if they want to be able to uh, export to the given market. So even though there is some research out there and some good research on uh, technical measures, I think it's by no means commensurate to the amount of uh, research that we still see that uses tariffs as the primary trade policy variable. And so I think a great contribution of this paper is to say, let's put tariffs to one side and let's talk about what people uh, really care about, uh, one particular part of it, which is uh, uh, environment-related uh, measures. I like the approach to data. Um, something that has plagued research on technical measures is access to data. Again, tariffs are easy. You go to WITS and you download uh, all of the tariffs. Um, it's clear, it, there's no issues of uh, how countries report them or anything else apart from a few uh, tiny quirks. Um, with environmental measures and technical measures more generally, it's much more complicated. So uh, the approach in this paper is to look at uh, notifications to the TBT committee in uh, WTO, then use an approach that separates out those that are purely about uh, environmental concerns versus those that are mixed, that is to say about the environment and something else, versus those that are about uh, something else entirely. So I think there's a, a nice contribution on the data side to in fact pull out uh, all of these measures. And that's something uh, I'm sure after you publish this, you'll be happy for other people to uh, use uh, the, the data set and go further with it. Then we've, we've got a model. Uh, it's a fairly typical gravity model uh, with fixed effects estimated by OLS. And then if I wanted to summarize, and, and this is you know always a harsh thing to do, but if I wanted to have one key finding from the paper, or at least what I interpret as the key finding, I'd say that the trade effects of environmental TBTs or technical measures are positive for larger, higher income and more developed countries. And if we look at the mechanism, at least the impression that I got is that we're primarily talking about a unit price effect. So maybe something going on with product quality or the perception of uh, product quality when we comply with the standard. So all of those are really interesting and uh, important uh, findings. Okay, so part of a discussant's job is to open up questions. Um, so I don't want to be a journal referee and go through line by line and be really irritating uh, about everything in the paper because I think it's a really nice paper. What I'd like to do is ask some questions that occurred to me when I was reading the paper and listening to the pre presentation. The first one is one that Fabio got to at the end. It's a very complicated question. I don't have the answer to it. But how do we interpret these results in a welfare sense? We're looking at the trade effects on the one hand, and we're finding costs for some countries, benefits for others. In theory, we could weigh those things up and find an overall kind of global uh, trade effect. But even though it's outside scope for the paper, and, and I think there's a future paper uh, that is looking at this, how do we balance whatever costs there might be for trade against the benefit that comes to the environment? Um, so it seems to me that we need some way and of course, it's out there in the environmental economics literature of quantifying the benefits of these regulations. In some of the early work on uh, technical barriers to trade, um, 
people use things like the statistical value of a life, um, you know, figuring out that a measure would save an extra X number of lives over a decade, then we put a statistical value on the life and that gives us a, a sort of a, an estimate of the gain that we're getting from the regulation, which we can then measure against the trade cost. But I think, you know, I, I, as much as it's outside scope uh, for this paper, I think that's where we really need to be getting to uh, when we're talking about this. Now, I said that I liked uh, the data approach, and I do. Uh, so using TBT notifications, it's a huge source of information. Let's make use of it. I think that's a great idea. When I looked at it, and this was admittedly a long time ago, um, so I, I'm interested to know if this has changed. But one thing that I observed was that even countries with pretty similar regulatory structures were engaging in very different types of notification behavior. So uh, I was looking at the European Union at the time, and I was finding even some European Union countries that were notifying really any new regulation uh, to the TPT committee, whether it was trade related or not, than others that were notifying nothing at all. Um, so how do we deal with that? It seems to me that we've got a measurement error uh, problem in the variable. Often we don't care about measurement error, um, provided that it is random. Um, but is the measurement error in this case uh, truly random? I'm concerned that it may not be. Um, one is that it may be linked to country income levels. So for instance, uh, lower income countries, I think tend to notify uh, uh, fewer TBTs to the committee. And then another concern is that there are particular unobserved characteristics of certain countries that mean that they tend to notify uh, less. So how do we deal with all of that and how confident can we be uh, in these measures? Then uh, a related question is whether or not the use of a notification is too low a threshold for causal inference. What I mean by that is that when we notify a measure, all we're saying is that the rule exists. It may not necessarily be a problem uh, for trade. So there's some other work out there that has used specific trade concerns. That's the second part of the procedure in the WTO TBT committee. So first I make a notification of my new regulation. Everyone else looks at it anyone who has a problem with it raises it as a specific trade concern in the committee. So a specific trade concern is when there's a country out there that believes that this measure is a market access problem for its exporters. So it would be really interesting to see if these results hold up um, and come out the same way uh, using specific trade concerns, um, because then we can be more certain that we're identifying measures that are truly seen as uh, problematic. Uh, final comment on the data, uh, I mean, in, in the, uh, I, I know they've done some sensitivity on this, but but there's also an issue about how we measure uh, to technical measures. Do we use a dummy for the existence of one measure? Do we count the measures? Or do we have some measure of uh, regulatory heterogeneity? And so I think there's definitely uh, some remaining questions there. To finish up, um, I'm a gravity nerd. So I've got to say uh, two things about the, uh, the, the gravity model. Um, the paper has both OLS and PPML. It leads with OLS. If it were me, I'd flip that round and put PPML uh, first. I think that's uh, where the, the literature is uh, going. Um, for those who follow gravity models, you'll know that it's always difficult to identify the effects of uh, country level policies. That is to say policies that don't vary uh, bilaterally. Um, so I, I made a suggestion here about uh, one way of doing that, which is using uh, internal uh, trade data and an interaction term. And there's a reference there uh, in the slides, um, but also using specific trade concerns gets around this issue because it bilateralizes the variable. Similarly, using a measure of uh, regulatory heterogeneity or regulatory distance would also bilateralize the variable. And so it would make the model uh, easier to uh, estimate. Then uh, I, I think Fabio gave you a, a preview of some of these results, but we're going to be coming back to this issue in uh, March 2024 when his co-author, uh, Emilia, is going to present uh, their follow-up paper uh, looking at not just the trade effects of these measures, but also the effects on some environmental outcomes. So uh, long-range planning, if you're interested in this, uh, keep an eye out for March 2024. Um, but again, I think this is an excellent paper in an under-researched area. It's very valuable. And uh, Fabio, we're really grateful uh, to you for coming along and uh, sharing it with us today. Thanks. 
Thank you so very much for that, Ben. Uh, really great input from you, as always. Let me just, before I give back the floor to Fabio for um, a rebuttal, um, just for those who are watching this and who are interested in getting down and dirty with the gravity estimates or getting into it at all, Ben has actually made a crash course for us and it's available on the website and it comes with uh, a really, 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 really useful webinar that we had. Was it back in January? Ben, yeah, I think it was Jan January, February. Yeah. 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 And I just want to make sure that everybody has seen that because that's an amazing resource um, that everybody should watch. And even I got really, you know, excited about modeling after that. So it's a good one. Uh, Fabio, let me, you're still here with us and, and alive and there's no smoke coming out. So let me give it, give, uh, give the floor back to you for a few, uh, uh, comments on Ben, on Ben's comments. And for the rest of you, we're running out of time here. So I see Mitali's asked a question. Um, we might want to ask, answer that one too, Fabio, is this data set available to everybody after? Uh, and then, so we'll, but we'll just start with those for now. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ben, for all these uh, very insightful comments. Um, let me just say that, yeah, if we want to have this public and available, uh, just, you know, uh, wait a little bit. Once we convince uh, everyone that this is strong enough, of course, this would be uh, public and available. So for, you know, scholars to, uh, you know, try to challenge uh, a little bit more what we are trying to find. So a lot of comments and uh, what I want to do, what I plan to do is to also uh, try to answer the question in the chat. So I have a long talk I can give based on Ben's comments, but then I'll stop sometimes to read the questions. Uh, and I already have one from Mariana. Hello, Mariana, nice to uh, see you uh, online. Uh, so basically, yeah, uh, you sum summarized very well what uh, we were doing well for effects, gain for environmental, um, for the environmental outcomes. So, yes, that's definitely something that we want to do. I mean, I don't want to spoil too much, but we found that there are actually gains. There are actually gains from the environment. We see that there are like tons of uh, carbons that are uh, possibly uh, lower that we're trying to compare with uh, these which to transport uh, 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 to uh, public transportation for huge country, a large country, developed country. So those are not very minimal in terms of environment. What is really important, and Ben, you clearly went straight to the point, is how this distribution is, is acting. So it's not that we have nothing in our end, is that uh, we are not sure that we are really clean environment for everyone at the expenses of those that should have expenses. Uh, so that's clearly a very important thing. Um, changes and difference in the notification structure. Uh, this flag to me like political economy factors. Now, Emilia is going to hate me because I'm going to also spoil a little bit of that. She's going to talk about this uh, in March. But what we observe is that there are like few countries that are actually regulating a lot of that, but they are regulating a very different way. So I don't want to go into details, but let's say US and China are the big, uh, the biggest regulators, but uh, they are regulating on very different emission intensive sectors, all on emission sector, but this is really related to political economy factors. So our point would be to say, okay, but that's much more than just protection for the environment going on. And again, I'll stop here. Otherwise, there's no reason to answer, to, to, to listen from Emilia, but she will do a great work because actually she is trying to, to do this and she's amazing on this. So I, I think that on March, you have a lot, have a lot more of, uh, to hear about those two things. Uh, difference for uh, low middle income and uh, high income. Uh, yes, there's a lot to say in terms of uh, development. So the development angle here is uh, is a, a pretty important. We didn't want to go too far because we believe that uh, it's too simplistic to say, okay, high income countries or developed countries are doing that at the expense of someone else. I think that there is much more. 
Here, there is the technology dimension that really matters, the added value dimension that really matters. So I think that the whole point that we want to make is that raising a measure just for the protection of the environment is not per se en enough. It's probably a necessary thing, but is not a sufficient thing to say that that measure is good. So that is the claim that we want to make. Um, so Fontanier, um, STC, yes, we were actually looking at that. There are not much actually, uh, I would say of STC on those because those environmental strict to sense who are actually very few in numbers. But uh, I mean, I just take this. So linking this to the literature of STC, I'm working also on that. Uh, so I know that that will be more convincing and saying, okay, uh, you know, those regulations are anti-trade for someone and people are made, uh, raising concern. Although, I mean, then you will agree with me that once you open that that uh, box, then there is a large debate because sometimes countries do not even make concern just because they know they're going to lose anyway. Yes. Or I've heard that, uh, you know, you ask everything that that does is just uh, <laughs> um, uh, disputed. I mean, it's actually under concern. So everything that the AS is doing is bad by definition. And, uh, and so, so this is, uh, you know, in some sense, not too, uh, uh, not too easy uh, to use, uh, but uh, it's good to at least link to the STC concern. Now, I promise to stop a little bit uh, because I have other things, but I want to reply to Rihanna so that people are not shy to um, answer other questions. So. Uh, it's just saying thank you so much. Uh, she's too nice. Uh, I was wondering uh, about your subgroup of facts. Could you mention how you measure the quality of environmental regulation in a given country? Short answer, Yale Index. So basically, we're just relying on uh, other indexes, uh, exogenous source or variation. Say, OK, this is how other folks that are much smarter than us are defining the countries in terms of environmental quality. And we are just doing this heterogeneity analysis, uh, looking at this index. Uh, so now that I answered the Rihanna, if there are other questions, please, uh, please, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, please ask. And uh, thanks to you, Rihanna. So I have well, other few things. If uh, Anna, if you want to stop me, that's great. Uh, no, I I wanted to ask since uh, you know people have been a little shy, then I'm going to grab the mic here. Uh, so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to ask you. So. I mean, the timing of this paper could not have been better. Uh, the COP is going on. Right. Uh, this uh, and we had trade week there or trade day uh, an industrial day. So uh, I'm going to have some like quick takeaways here. Uh, I'm going to try to get a tweetable out of you or something. Uh, well, I'll tweet was the thing. Now it's an X or whatever. But, you know, one sentence. So if you were walking down, um, uh, you know, the halls and the conferences at, at, at COP today, what is the one takeaway that you would bring from this paper to policymakers there? They might not even be trade people, right? So in from the environmental people, what is it that they could take away from this? Secondly, I would also, because we can look forward to the second presentation in March, and Ben already posted uh, you know, some further research here. So thank you so much for Ben doing that, Ben. That made my job so easy. But with the data and the things that you have in front of you, for those researchers that are coming in from developing countries, what are the things that you think that are things that you're really burning, the questions that you wanted to, to look into, but you don't have the time? Uh, or you know the resources to do so yourself, but you would be like, oh, I wish somebody would take this idea and run with it. So one for policymakers, one for researchers. That's what I wanted um, to bring in here. And you can just answer it however you like, and then just jump on in whenever you want to. Yeah, th th thank you very much. Um, so uh, basically, um, take away for COP, yes. Uh, it's very important. Uh, one thing that I would say, if uh, I think that would have any value saying that saying that the COP is that we don't need really to uh, we, we don't need more measures. We need uh, common rules. That's what we're actually uh, finding here. So basically, it's not just uh, having uh, the flag of saying, okay, I'm, I'm putting this and putting that. Environment is a, a common problem. Trade is also something that is linking people. So there is no other ways that other way than just uh, 
moving those measures, regulation, domestic even regulation, even if you don't address this, even domestic regulation should be really a little bit more harmonized because otherwise it's just not going to work. So that's that's my take. And uh, research ideas, I mean, well, yes, I mean, we can really look at this uh, with an helicopter flight on, uh, on the global trade, on all the notification, but I think that really the details really matter here. So I wish that someone is uh, taking those measures and really looking at how each single measure is acting in terms of, again, the same thing, trade versus environment. Why I think that this is very important because it's really complementing the, uh, the evidence that we are trying to show here. So here it's, I mean, Ben knows a lot already pointed, you know, count, PPM, all of this, just saying that whatever I'm showing is just an average. But then what I'm saying, I'm trying to say that heterogeneity is huge. So I think that those macro studies should be really complemented with country studies where people are saying this NTM is working this way for this value chain and therefore is having this impact on trade and these environmental effects. And that is going to be possibly a great way and possibly leading to a meta-analysis. I don't know. That is just to find, find the, uh, the results. Uh, then I think... Um, there is, there is a question that I want to answer. You can see the CBAM as an NTV, you know, basically we're using actually a notification from the WTO, so that's, that's not it. Uh, but I guess that is, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, you know, even out of, of the thing that was not even in place in our, uh, in our period. So we're uh, not, uh, I mean, not too updated. I mean, we, we stopped in 2020, but the results are nice, even if you add, couple of years more to this. So it seems to be pretty robust. Um, then I think that I just need to say thanks to Ben because uh, those things that you mentioned, like PPML, yeah. I mean, in terms of publication strategy, I think I should move that to the, to, to the text. Uh, let's see what uh, what the editor is saying and uh, possibly uh, we'll, we'll do that way. Also, thanks for suggesting this paper. Um, uh, on Canadian journal, I, I think I think we did some uh, sensitivity analysis with uh, intranational trade, and it, it was a bit uh, I, I was consistent basically. That's that's a short story, uh, but uh, I mean having a second look to 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 this issue would not hurt us. Uh, regulatory distance and how to you know disentangle those uh, those effects that are really country based. Yeah, it's always uh, it's, it, it's also is also uh, worth exploring. As you are seeing, I mean, I'm not selling something that I cannot sell. So I'm very transparent in saying, okay, there are some things that we can say. But of course, this is not the unique paper that is telling everything. So my point is much more has to be done. Yep. Maybe I can I can chip in. I mean, thanks so much for uh, talking about additional research ideas. I have one more that I want to get into the conversation. So I think something uh, there have been, a, I can only really think of sort of two or three papers that have done this. Um, but using micro data uh, to look at the impact of regulatory measures, I think is potentially very interesting. Um, you, you know, what you've shown here in this paper is that we have the ability to go through WTO notifications and identify very, at, at a pretty fine level of detail, uh, the type of measure that's involved. And if I remember correctly, we can also identify the products uh, that are affected. So you can go from there to looking at the impact on firms in a particular country, because some of the qualitative literature tells a story where uh, not only is there heterogeneity in all of the dimensions uh, that you talk about in the paper, but there's also heterogeneity at the level of firms. So larger, more productive firms find it pretty easy to adapt to a foreign technical specification. Smaller, less productive firms don't. Um, and we can potentially get some really nice measurements uh, out of doing that. There's a, a paper that I saw in the world economy probably about a year ago uh, where some researchers took Chinese data uh, on firms producing, uh, they could identify firms that were producing lighters, you know, uh, the cigarette lighters. And there was a new regulation in the European Union that applied only to that product. And it was a discrete change in the safety requirements. And so they were able to identify the uh, sort of lost exports and the way in which activity was reallocated across firms at that very, very specific level. And so to me, that's kind of the next frontier uh, when we're talking about things like environmental measures. I think, you know, you guys have done a great job 
of telling the macro story. Um, and it should make us hungry to find out what the next bit of uh, the story is using micro data. So um, as usual, we've uh, we've gone slightly over. So Fabio, thank you so much um, for giving us your time today. That was really an excellent uh, presentation. Um, I got so much out of the paper and the presentation. I really do uh, uh, recommend it to, to everyone to take a look at the paper. Um, uh, since Amelia is here, I should say that I misspoke when I said it was March 2024. It's actually April 2024. I was going to get an email from her in five minutes time saying what I'm on in March. Um, so it is actually April. Please keep an eye on that. Um, and uh, I'll just remind everyone that uh, we're keeping the environmental theme going. Um, we had to reschedule our November uh, webinar um, that will now be happening on January 18th, uh, as usual, at 9 a.m. New York time. And we're going to be talking about CBAMs, so carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Um, it's a huge and very topical uh, question. We've got two uh, great uh, researchers working in very applied uh, contexts to come along and talk about it, Amar Breckenridge and Stuti uh, Toshi. And so we're really looking forward to that webinar. In the meantime, let me wish my partner in crime, Hannah, and also Fabio, uh, all the best for the end of year uh, holidays. And of course, a great 2024. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us. All the best for the end of the year. And we look forward to seeing you again in January. I just echo all of that. And I just would also like to add uh, Rabiul Islam there to the list of also uh, Santa's helpers, right? Uh, yeah. So he always, 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 always does our beautiful posters. Um, and so he's one of, of the, a lot of people who are volunteering to help us make this uh, webinar series happen. So thank you so much, Fabio. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody who tuned in. We'll see you again in the new year. Thank you very much all, and uh, see you next time. Thanks okay. again. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.